At its launch, the 2018 Yamaha Tracer 900 GT was £10,649, which in 2020, with inflation, was £11,086. The new Tracer 9 GT is £12,202. So what do you get for your money? If you want to see what this bike looks like clean and sparkling, you'll have to wait for another video or go to a dealer. This is 2,000 miles of use so far, so let's not faff about, let's have a closer look. The 2018 model was fitted with Dunlop Sportmax D222s. They didn't get the best reviews from owners, but they were fairly typical OEM tyres made to a Japanese bike manufacturer's budget. Remember, these are often quite different to what you'd buy aftermarket. For 2021 though, Yamaha has put better rubber on as standard, and this time gone for Bridgestone T32s, which I found give bags of confidence in the dry and have been perfect in torrential rain too, so it looks like there's less of a special being made for for the bikes now. Usually we swap out tires on long-term test bikes, but I wanna keep these on as nobody's gonna buy a new bike and then wanna spend another 250 pound or so replacing the tires straight away. So let's wait and see how, how they wear. So far, so good. The new wheels uh, are lighter than the previous model, but I'm not gonna pretend I can feel that. It should make for more nimble handling, but we'll get to the chassis in a bit. The calipers and discs are pretty much unchanged from the last model, but there is a new radial master cylinder. The brakes are fine, but they don't have the initial bite that many modern bikes do, so jumping off a sporting machine like my S1000XR, I feel a little bit soft. Having said that, it's probably the right choice for something so accessible and ironically when I rode the 2018 model I commented that the brakes felt a bit sharp at first. I do wish we'd got braided brake lines as standard on this model, um, but what's most important is that there's now cornering ABS which makes it a lot safer. It doesn't matter how good you think you are, having the ability to fully anchor down mid-turn in an emergency really could make all the difference, so uh, you know, I'm a fan of cornering ABS. There's also cornering traction control now, lift control, which you can turn off, and slide control. Now if you don't like electronic stuff like this, that's fine. You'll never know it's there unless things go wrong. And the last few years have shown us that this tech, which is based on the same hardware across all manufacturers, so they're not just trying little things with their own ideas, this stuff isn't causing any reliability issues. The suspension's another place where the extra expense of the new model goes with semi-active kit from Kyabra on this GT. You've got two modes, one going softer than the other, and you just have to roll off the throttle to quickly switch between the modes. If you're in traction control, by the way, you have to turn that off before you can change modes because it still sees the throttle as being open. Now, you can feel the difference. As things speed up on tight back rides, I tend to go over to the firmer mode one. Remember, what this does is, if you imagine that's no damping and that's uh, full damping, uh, one of the modes, like the, the softer mode will give you a spread that's kind of like that and the firm mode will give you a spread within the damping range that's kind of like that. It, that's, it, there's no technical stuff in that. It just gives a range of damping, one on the softer side, one on the firmer side. Now anyway, neither is overly hard, even with a pillion on, and it can get a little bit bouncy at times, but overall it is a good system that covers normal riding. On a bike like this, which is meant to cover some sportiness and a lot of touriness. I reckon it's pretty well set up and it's, it's definitely a, you know, a hell of a lot of fun to ride when you want to get a bit silly on back roads. The, there they are, the indicators are LED as standard but weirdly they're nearly all circuit board inside with only one LED in each. You can see them okay, uh, you know, when I've been following these bikes you can see them fine but I would have liked to see more light out of them, especially during the day just to make sure that drivers have seen your signals. If you have a look this is how they compare my S1000XR and my 1999 ZX6R. Now this ain't science but they are all at the same exposure on the camera in, in these shots. Now onto the headlights and they're a weird setup because this is the dip, this is the main beam and these are the daytime running lights plus the cornering lights. Now as soon as the bike starts to lean, 
the corner lights activate, you know, obviously on the side that you're leaning. But I think they seem to illuminate a little bit too much of the verge and not quite enough of the road itself. They do work and you can see the difference here. But the biggest issue is that as you approach a corner under braking, the nose dips and the harsh, harsh edge of the LED lights make the bend disappear. fairly typical in a lot of LED lighting setups because the way they work you have quite a hard cut between the light and no light uh, and I must admit you know I, I found it quite I, I find it on you know on bikes quite frightening as you go into a corner and you're braking like oh shit the, the corner's gone but that's on dip on main beam the headlights really good given a great spread all over the road if there's nobody coming the other way then leave it on main but I shot this stuff at 11 o'clock at night so it's fully dark but it's always hard to capture bike headlights hopefully though you'll get an idea of them in some cases they're better than they look on film but it's that disappearing of the corner under braking on dip that I find the problem but to be fair it's not really something that's isolated to the Tracer 9. Anyway the fairing and screen then I like these intakes and inside you can see little little wings in there which are cool uh, and I found that, that you know it works fine. Michael Mann rode it the other day and said it felt like his legs were getting uh, getting a bit of wind behind them pushing them apart. He's six foot tall though whereas I'm only five foot ten and it's the same with the screen if I move around here. Michael found it noisy uh, just like Michael Neves actually from MCN but I don't find it quite bad and both of those are taller guys than me so you know it it's all right. It's definitely not great though. It, it shakes like a shitting dog at speed and it's noisier than some, but over a hundred miles of motorway, I haven't got off desperate to replace it. I would like to try a smaller screen though, because on back roads, it'd be nice to get a bit more air to my helmet and less buffeting noise. You can adjust it with one hand and dropping it down, it does give you a bit more air, but it's still, you know, it's still a big old unit. Now the mirrors are well spe spaced out. And they give a good view. Plus they don't really vibrate and I've not smacked them into any van mirrors, so I'd say they're all good. Now down to the clocks. Well, these are what let it down for me. All the really useful info is crammed into the left. Then on the right, you have four slots. You can put the trips in here if you want, but I'd like to be able to have the riding and suspension modes in there because they're kind of what I fiddle around with most. They're kind of what I want to see. I just, I think having just those four slots is a bit of a waste of space on that side where you can see what they've done with the left. So I'd like to see a bit more in there and maybe a bit more customizability. I guess theoretically that could be a firmware update as they're TFTs. Now the reversed out display is fine to read in bright sunlight but it can scratch easily. If you if you wipe rain off after the bike's been, been sitting, which you, it, it doesn't collect rain when you're riding but if it's got rain sitting on it, after being standing still. You kind of need to wipe it because some of the small digits are, are harder to read. You know, if you wipe that rain off, it's really easy to start putting fine scratches in that in that plastic cover. So I've fitted a, a, an easy grip screen protector on there. Fitting the screen protector wasn't too bad really. It's a little bit more fiddly on the Tracer 9 GT than when I put it on my S1000XR because you've got these curves in the screen. So I found it best to get it all set up on like the bottom uh, or on the main face and then across the left and the bottom edge and then start folding the very little top edge over. Leave it for a while, but then come back with a really clean, soft cloth and gently burnish that down because you can wedge that in there and I found that pushes the last of the moisture out and it all conforms fine. Do watch out, you haven't got any uh, bits of dust on there. Make sure that the isopropyl alcohol wipe has dried fully, but then get a really clean, ideally lint-free cloth, but a really clean cloth and just give it a gentle quick wipe over to make sure the dust is gone before you put the film on. Make sure your fingers are wet with the fluid and make sure that you keep the, the adhesive sheet uh, wet with the fluid too. Getting the little top ones in was fiddly because you can't really get your fingers in there but put plenty of fluid on them and then they'll just float into place. You can move them around and then they you know gently burnish them uh, and then they'll just dry out and it doesn't completely cover the scratches that are already there 
So, but it does make it look a lot better and there won't be any more. I, I genuinely would recommend you put this on as soon as you get the bike because it does stop those little scratches. And and yeah, this one was sent to me by Easy Grip. I contacted them and said, look, I think it needs it. Can we try it on there? Um, but I before that, I'd actually bought one for my Grom as well because that has the same black screen and that's got scratches on it from cleaning. I genuinely believe this is worth having. Some people don't really get why you'd want to put a screen protector on. And on some bikes it's unnecessary, but on bikes like this, especially with a, like a softish plastic, especially with a black backing, you can really see those scratches. Now, bike social members, by the way, can save 20% on these, as well as other big discounts like 15% off at Performance Parts, 10% off at Evotech Performance and RNG. As I shoot this, there's 177 deals on there, so do make sure you check it out at bikesocial.co.uk. I'm testing sat navs at the moment, so the left dash is hidden, but I'm, you know, to be honest, I'm not really missing that much in currently how it's set up. But on that subject, this is one of the few mods I've made so far. The Yamaha sat-nav mount, which it is just folded metal, but it costs a hefty £44.70. But it does get the GPS out of the way, so ignore all the Garmin we've got there, because I'm trying to compare the two and see how, how they both work together. Um, obviously the Garmin would fit on there instead of the TomTom. -tom. Um, but yeah, it gets that GPS out of the way, but trouble is it makes it, it hard to get to the keys. Oh, and uh, the Tracer Speedo overreads by 9% according to GPS, but interestingly, the mileage seems pretty much spot on. So it's not like the, uh, like, it's not like directly linked like the cable drives of old. Now, if you have a look behind the clocks, uh, you'll see the 12 volt output. You can get a USB socket from Yamaha for this that you're wiring separately. Wiring the in your own accessories is pretty easy. So you only have to take this panel off uh, to, to, to get to it. And, my wiring's a bit of a mess under here, but that's because I need to take all this stuff off again, so I can't really trim the cables down to suit. Now I have taken all the panels and the tank off for a look around the bike, and it's something I always do to get to know any machine, yeah, you know, whether it's one that I'm lucky enough to have on loan or one of the ones I've bought. Uh, and this does come apart pretty easily, actually. I'd, I'd take these sides off for like a really thorough cleaning, being careful of the electrics, obviously because it's just one bolt on each side, just at the front, and then three little plastic push clips. So it's, it's really easy. And it's probably worth mentioning that these small side panels, they've got a spacer on the bolt in there that you could lose, so just be careful as you, as you take them out. And uh, as you take them out, they have to slide forwards to come off. So just be aware of those clips in there. But the plastic on these panels seems good. Now, some bikes I've had before, Taking the panels off, I've had clips break on them the first time you take them off when they're brand new. So these, it's good plastic, it's got good flexibility to it. I've had no issues getting this stuff apart, even as I've been learning to take it apart. Obviously, pretty well nobody's going to be doing their own servicing while they're under warranty or they've got on PCP or anything like that. I mean, I know some people might, but pretty well nobody's going to. There is a maintenance trip counter, but you can reset it yourself, and there's no service warning light. Now, while the 2018 Tracer 900 had an oil level switch, the new Tracer 9 uses an oil pressure switch. So that means it's more accurate, but it does mean that if the oil light did come on, you really must stop and check the level straight away. It's just worth knowing there's a different setup. Obviously, obviously that's really unlikely to happen um, because it's more accurate, so you're less likely to have small changes in the level affecting it, but it's just worth knowing that it's a pressure switch in these now. Okay, so the bar controls are pretty good. The cruise controls e really easy to operate, and swapping modes is is great. You know, nice big button. Dead easy to do. Just remember to be off the throttle. I just don't get why Yamaha uh, has the mode button where the flasher normally is. Now I've frantically changed modes at other road users many times, and they obviously don't notice. But what you should do is press the light button here. I guess if you've got only got Yamahas or only had them, you, you get used to it. But when you're swapping between different bikes, if you've got um, you know, a few machines. It's just the times you want to give a quick flash and you're like, oh, it's not that bad. Anyway, that's their choice. So you can scroll through the display with the thumb wheel, but I find this a real fiddle. The, the main reason I'll use it is to adjust the excellent heated grips, which are standard on the GT and really powerful and have more control than you need with 10 steps. The numbers all go to 11. Getting into them, especially with cold hands, is a, is a right faff. I found, I thought, oh, I forgot I've got heated grips on here. Uh, you know, uh, you, you're trying to find that, and as you press the button, press the thumb wheel in, it skips to the one of the other settings. And it's just a bit frustrating. Something that a distraction, I think, could be smooth on something that you're trying to set while you're going along. 
Uh, fuel tank's the same size it used to be at 18 litres. And riding around Wales uh, with Helen on the back, I got 51 miles a gallon, which is a range of up to 202 miles. The fuel gauge isn't very good. It's, it's the same as on my MT-10. It's full for ages, then suddenly it's half empty because you've only got one bar for the first half that you'd use. I haven't run it dry yet, but I did do 20 miles with the reserve light on and I still only got 17 litres of fuel in it. So it looks like I could have got another 10 miles in there. I will test that another time, but on another trip, the gauge went from full to half after 115 miles, then dropped another bar at 140 miles. The final bar was at 170 miles and it was flashing with a fuel light on at 194 miles. I stopped for fuel at 202 miles and got 16 litres in. So to be fair, the halfway point isn't actually that far out. It just takes some getting used to, to realize that it says full, 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 full. Oh, I'm half empty. The seat's comfortable enough. It cups my bum pretty well, and it's a good couple of hours before I start jigging around it. And I do tend to have a sensitive, sensitive behind. Basically, it's, it's fine for a full tank of fuel. Uh, it's, it's definitely one of the better comfort bikes I've ridden. And I would actually say, based on my experience of the previous model versus thousand, I found this more comfortable, but it is a very personal thing. Uh, if you check out the video up here, you'll be able to see uh, what Helen thought of it as, as a pillion. The seat's 810 millimeters high or 825 millimeters if you move it, which is much lower than the 850 or 865 millimeter seat height of the 2018 model. I can easily get my feet flat on the floor and even get my bum clear off the seat. So that's, gives a lot of confidence for me. The, the seating position feels natural, uh, though Michael thought the pegs were a little bit too far back on his ride to Alton Park for Bennett's, Bennett's British Superbike round. So he couldn't comfortably have the balls in it, of his feet on them. I, I, I find it fine. Again, that's gonna depend on your height and your build. Uh, not that it would help Michael, but you can actually move these pegs back and up slightly. I'd only really do that on a track day. The pegs can touch down on roundabouts when you're pushing on, but to be honest, I kind of like that. The main frame isn't the same as the current MT-09. Uh, if you think back, the first Tracer, the MT-09 Tracer, was basically a redressed MT-09. It had the same length swing arm, which wasn't quite as stable. Then the Tracer 900, 2018, that had the longer swing arm, it had some more adaptations to make it more of a dedicated sports tour. And then we come to the Tracer 9 GT, which really is, you know, it, it's quite different to the MT-09. Up, up front, it's, it's a slightly different design of frame up front, and it does actually cant the uh, engine forward uh, a bit more. And the subframe is actually different as well. This is steel on this one, which how it's got that larger load capacity than the old model. The old one had a maximum of 167 kilograms, and you've got to remember that that includes the rider and pinion's weight. You can get 193 kilograms on this new one, and it's also homologated to carry the panniers it comes with, the GT model, and a top box. Now that's something that you couldn't technically do with the previous model, uh, because Yamaha, it, well, it wasn't designed to do that, so technically you shouldn't have panniers and top box on there. On this, you can have them all on there. And of course, that's the other mod I've made, adding a £79.70 top box mounting plate, a £213.50 litre case, and the £36.20 backrest. Uh, and that is a Shad mounting system, although the prices kind of direct from Shad are, are very similar. So unusually, you're not really seem to pay more for the, the manufacturer branding on them. So it's kind of good to see. And the panniers it comes with are a good size. Uh, they take a full face lid each when you get it at just the right angle. And you can get plenty in that top box too. You can get another two full face lids in there if you want it as a gauge. Plus there's a decent amount of space under the seat, which I really appreciate um, because I know I always have a lock and a puncture repair kit with me wherever I go. Now, while we're round the back, this rear hugger, it's not really that effective. The shot can get pretty grubby in bad weather. So I'd have liked to have seen that a bit bigger or something or some kind of a bit more thought going into the weather protection there. So anyway, the engine. Triple engine, it's now 889cc, which is up from 847cc. It makes 117.3 brake horsepower at 10,000 RPM, which is 3.8 bhp more than 2018. It also makes 68.6 .6 pound foot, which is 4.1 more than 2018, and it does it a useful 1500 RPM earlier. 
all while being Euro 5 compliant and while making a great noise from the exhaust as you sit on it. As one goes by, it sounds pretty good, but when you're on it, they just tune that, that induction roar and the, the note just really well. And look, obviously not on this side, but if you have a look at the other side as well, no massive ugly dustbin end can. In fact, no end can at all. The exhaust ports from two outlets underneath. It's, it's unusual. And especially when you, you know, we used to see an end can and seeing them as a, as a feature. But it's, it's kind of cool. You can actually get replacement full systems for them. In fact, from performance parts, when you get discounts at bikesocial.co.uk, uh, you can get a full system for this. Um, which obviously puts an NCAM back on it. But, you know, as it is, it's it's a good sell. And some people reckon that a triple's the best of an inline four and, a, and, and of an of a twin, but then others think they're just a compromise that isn't as good as either. And this one does sound great. <laughs> and it's got so much drive out of corners and roundabouts. And it, it just feels really rapid. You know, bear in mind I'm coming from that 165 brake horsepower S1000 XR. Which are obviously a four cylinder. The drive out corners is it's really took me by surprise, especially coming out around about sometimes. <laughs> oh, you know, you really get you really get excited riding with it. And it's got that punch you want for a road bike, rather than the more peaky feel you can sometimes get from a four. It hasn't got the character of a V-twin, but then it's also not as lumpy. On the other hand, it's a little bit gruff for long motorway journeys. It's not it's not horrible. But if you're the kind of rider doing these trips almost all the time, you might want something just a little bit smoother, like a four where it just purrs along. Don't take that as too much of a criticism. You know, again, I've done a lot of motorway stuff on this quite recently, and I've certainly not gone, oh, I wish I wasn't taking this. It, you know, it, it works. It's, it's, it's very, very, it is, it's a good compromise between them. I feel like I'm trying to justify something here. I'm not. I like a really, I, I kind of like extremes of engines, which in my head I keep thinking, oh, I don't know, but a V twin, and then like you spend the day with it, and you're like, mm. the point is, for the more bendy roads, you know, when you're doing sports touring stuff, motorways aren't where most people want to spend most of the time. You might have to use a motorway to get somewhere, and that's fine. You're certainly not going to regret being on this on the way there in any stretch of your imagination. Um, but but yeah, what this is made for, and what most of us surely enjoy, is that exploring bends and, and you know, sweeping roads and beautiful scenery, and, and it's brilliant, it's brilliant. Gearbox, very good, you know, the, the up and down quick shifter, it, it's great to have, not just for the sound and, and the fun of it, but because it make, does make for a smoother ride for your pillion. There's a slightly longer throw on the lever than my super tight S1000XR, but it's still, it's still satisfyingly easy to use. My only problem with it is that a few times I've somehow messed up the change uh, and the lever just, just wouldn't move. So I have to take my foot clean off and use a clutch to knock it down again. I think that's just the way I've been doing it and maybe it's maybe I'm not giving my foot enough travel between, between changes. It's not something I've done on my BMW, um, but you know, it's it's, it has been frustrating a couple of times when you kind of on it a bit uh, and you go to change there and it doesn't. <laughs> on a road bike, really, it's not an issue. On a race bike, you might complain or maybe change the way I ride. So after two months and 2000 miles, what do I think so far? Well, almost every part of this bike is very, very good. If not outstanding, if not something that makes you go, oh, oh my God, that's the best thing I've ever had. But it all comes together to make something that's so incredibly easy to ride however you want to ride it that it's just really hard not to recommend it it's this package that becomes something incredible i can think of bikes you know i've had 20 21 a lot of bikes over the years and i can think of like my monster s4 i think of that engine that was just incredible outstandingly incredible but the rest of it was horrible to ride. You know, I can think of things on my XR that I think those brakes are outstanding. But then there's other bits I find the bike quite big, quite bulky, quite hard to manage. Everything's 
very good on here. In fact, it's only the clocks that the, the shape of the clocks that I uh, the one thing I say I don't like that. This bike is faster when you want it to be, but it's not intimidating. It's big enough to carry a pillion and a decent amount of luggage, but it's really easy to handle. And given its spec, while it's far from cheap, it does actually compare very well with the competition. Now I've got some videos with the likes of the Versus Thousand coming up, but what do you think? If you've bought one of these, I'd really like to hear how you're getting on with it. So let, let me know in the comments below. So do make sure you check out bikesocial.co.uk because we have got so many reviews on there, so much advice, so much touring and features and everything, but also hundreds of discounts, deals, offers, competitions, so check it out. Hit subscribe. If you like this video, please hit like. If you didn't like it, hit the unlike button twice, just to be sure, and I'll see you again soon. So until next time, check out bikesocial.co.uk because we've got so many reviews and advice, so much. So until next time, do make sure you check out bikesocial.co.uk. So until next time, do make sure you check out bikesocial.co.uk because we've got so many reviews on there, so much advice and touring and everything on there, but also hundreds of rewards. So do make sure you check out bikesocial.co.uk because we've got so many reviews on there, so much advice and touring and, and features. But also we've got so many offers and discounts and deals and competitions, so check it out. Until then, hit subscribe. So do check it. So do make sure you check out bikesocial.co.uk because we have got so much. Fuck me. <laughs>